Hello, Trinity St. Peter's and all those who are joining us online. Welcome to this fourth Sunday in the Advent season. We are, believe it or not, almost to Christmas Day. And so I hope that you will be able to join us if you're able. Uh, even though we can't gather together in person for Christmas Eve, we will have a 5 p.m carol, sing along, uh, dress up in whatever Christmas wear you have, uh, which will be on Zoom and again at five o'clock. If you need the information, feel free to contact me, uh, but it should also be in the newsletter. And since I know many of you will ask, Lucille is just on the couch over there, um, but she's very snuggled up under a bunch of blankets and just uh, seems very comfortable and cozy in her nap time, so I hated to disturb her, but I know that she would send you her greetings. <laughs> and so now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Our reading today is from the Gospel of Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. 
and the Lord God will give to him the throne of your ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing is impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I grew up in a Presbyterian church that, true to its Reformation roots, uh, shunned any kind of veneration of the Virgin Mary. There were no Mary statues around. There were not even stained glass windows. Um, and, you know, in truth, she became more like a supporting character in the nativity story. Uh, the one that some young girl would dress up as um, in the nativity play. But really, you know, to my mind, she was sort of like this pious woman who, you know, yes, did a fine job. Uh, but, you know, really until the man came and was able to, you know, take over the real work. <laughs> and so I'm so glad that this Advent, this fourth Sunday of Advent, we have, Mary, we have the Gospel of Luke. In Matthew's Mary, we simply talk about her and her experience, but in Luke, she speaks for herself. 
And what she says in the story that surrounds her in our gospel today is an extraordinary one. An angel, Gabriel, appears to this young unmarried woman with terrifying and life-changing news. And we could certainly see how Mary would ask, how can this be? And much ink has been spilled going over whether or not Mary was really a virgin. Was she a virgin after she gave birth to Jesus? Was it really just an unplanned pregnancy? All of this, I think, mostly betraying our obsession <laughs> historically as a church with women's bodies and specifically with controlling the narratives around women's bodies. But to me, the truly extraordinary thing is that her story shows us something of how God works in the world, which is through and with our whole selves with our whole bodies. As Pastor Nadia Boltz Weber says, I think Mary deserves our devotion because in her we see what casting our lot with and being blessed by the God of Israel really looks like. Namely, that being blessed means seeing God in the world and trusting that God is at work even in the things we can't see or understand or imagine. Blessedness is being used for God's purpose more than it is getting what I want or things being easy. And in this line of thought, I was on a call with a friend who uh, just a couple of weeks ago had given birth. And we were laughing that to her, the most unbelievable part of the, nativ of the story of Mary and Jesus' birth is that Mary just got up and left the inn the next day. As she said, there's just a lot going on on that first day after giving birth. And we also laughed that the song about the newborn baby Jesus is Silent Night, as if a song called Silent Night describes any night with a newborn. And all of this did make me laugh, but I, I don't share it with you in an attempt to be flippant. Because I think if we believe in the truth of the Incarnation, then we have to also believe in the very human pregnancy, birth, and little baby life of Jesus. Its similarity to the rest of humanity, to how we also came into the world, is precisely the point. And we lose the depth of grace and presence of God with us if we pretend that Jesus was somehow another kind of human, that Mary was somehow not like all first-time mothers postpartum. And so while the church focused on preserving Mary's virginity, it nearly missed her incarnate living. The adult Jesus, in fact, would spend much of his time arguing with religious leaders over similar points that they were missing God in their attempt to instead be right or comfortable. In a sermon entitled The Face in the Sky, theologian Frederick Beekner writes of the Incarnation, Those who believe in God can never in a way be sure of him again. If holiness and the awful power and majesty of God were present in this least auspicious of all events, this birth of a peasant's child, then there is no place or time so lowly and earthbound, but that, holy, but that holiness can be present there too. And I love that. That Mary's whole self, her body, was where God brought God's self into the world. Her body that maybe she thought had too many stretch marks or was too thin, her body that was objectified by society and treated as less than a man's. Her body that breastfed the infant Jesus through long, sleepless nights. Her body that was real and messy and imperfect and utterly holy. How many times do we say no to God because we don't feel like we are a worthy enough vessel? As we pick apart all the ways in which we don't hold up, in which we need to change this, lose that, 
that we affirm the idea of God working everywhere and in all things. But how often do we forget to include ourselves, our whole selves, in that all things? Like the church historically, it's easy for us to focus more on making things pure than a holy, more on keeping things nice than on them being real. I was reminded of the beloved children's book, The Velveteen Rabbit, and the conversation that occurs between the rabbit and another toy. They say, real isn't how you are made. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. It doesn't happen all at once. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all. Because once you're real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. If we judge ourselves based on the opinions of those who don't understand, we might never know how remarkable we truly are. And I suspect the truth is that if we cannot offer this grace to ourselves, this truth, I doubt we can really offer it to others in our life. And if we can't be fully human, how can we comprehend a God who was precisely that? Mary shows us a way forward with her simple yes. That faith is not always an intellectual exercise that we can figure out. It is embodied. It's physical. And what comes to life quietly within us becomes the faith and witness that we bring to the world around us. A world that is full of humans, just as messy, strange, and utterly similar to us. And we meet that world not with some rarefied version of ourselves, but often with the very same self that we were before that yes, anxious, fearful, worried about the future, because it's not our work that makes us holy, it is God's. It's God's grace working in us that makes our whole selves holy, that wastes nothing, and that can turn even a young and unknown teenage girl in a small town in the Roman Empire into the revered Queen of Heaven, Mary, Mother of God, the Theotokos, the God-bearer. That becoming real is tough and may leave us a little more ragged than we were before. But what a gift losing that idea of perfection can be. This is a comfort to me in these days to remember this, that it wasn't Mary alone who made herself into who she became. It was merely her willingness to be present to God and God's love that opened up a totally different future that would change the whole world. She reminds me that it's not about doing. It's not about me doing all the right things. Sometimes it's just about saying yes and having the courage to see that word unfold in my life. On this fourth Sunday in the Advent season, on the cusp of Christmas, May we, too, offer our whole selves the grace and love that God offers to us so abundantly. May our yes to love make us truly real. And as Mary said, may it be with us according to God's word. Amen.
for our prayer today, I'd like to read the Magnificat, Mary's great song of praise. Will you join me in prayer? My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. <laughs>